We're continuing on in our series this morning. In fact, uh, we're ending this series on saying yes to the great adventure, although we are going to talk about another couple of adventures in the upcoming series. But this morning we're in Joshua chapter 5, and this is what it says. When Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. How many, that would make you anxious if you looked up and there's a person standing in front of you with a sword. Let's see. So some of you are not easily intimidated. And, and Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. I'd like to start with this thought this morning, and that is that you, if you, you cannot really say yes to the great adventure in your life if you cannot overcome painful memories. We really have a hard time saying yes to the great adventure if we're still controlled by painful memories. Let, let me explain what I mean by this. This is not the first time Joshua has been here. Forty years earlier, when Moses was leading the nation of Israel, he had been assigned a reconnaissance mission. He and 11 other people went into the promised land with an assignment to assess things like, what was the agriculture like? Was it plentiful or was it scarce? What was the population of the area like? Were there a lot of people or few people? Did they have walled and fortified cities or did they live more like nomads? And so he had a lot of information. 10 of the 12 spies, when they got back, they came back with a very negative report. In fact, this is what they said. We can't attack these people. They are stronger than we are. So they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they explored. They said the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there were of great size. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and they looked the same to them. We looked the same to them. Now, I don't know what the exact ratio is of grasshopper to human, but how many suppose they might have been exaggerating just a little bit? And uh, Joshua and Caleb attempted to encourage the people that were hearing these reports that, in fact, they could succeed. They agreed with the facts. There were a lot of people. There were walled cities. There were certainly some challenges to overcome, but they believed a different conclusion. Same facts, different conclusion. And so they tried as best they could to influence the Israelites not to be afraid, but to boldly go into the land that God had called them. So this was the place where Joshua had experienced failure in an attempt to influence people to take a bold step. You can't say yes to the great adventure if you cannot overcome painful memories. Joshua can't bypass this place, but he can learn a new path in it. If you can't overcome a bitter memory, then you're destined to have a bitter future. And so Joshua has to work through this. Now, this is where some people, when you read a biblical story like this, a lot of modern people get very upset with these kinds of stories. And they say things like this. I think that's part of what's wrong with the Bible. I think that's part of what's wrong with religion. I think that's part of what's wrong with Christianity. Because one culture should not invade and subjugate another culture just because they're different, just because their fashion is different, or their music preferences are different, or their language is different, or their menu is different. This is just what I don't like about religion. And what I should tell you is that's not an accurate picture at all. There's some things you should know about the culture that was being invaded right here. In Deuteronomy, the ninth chapter, it says, after the Lord your God has driven them out before you, do not say to yourself, the Lord brought me here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness. God said, that's not why I'm sending you in there. No, it is on account of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is going to drive them out before you. You see, the way these cultures treated the poor, the weak, and the young would still scandalize people today. The leaders of the most powerful companies and countries would all speak out 
about the kind of atrocities that were going on. For example, one of their practices that they would do in this land is that they would offer their children as a sacrifice and they would burn them alive. And when the priest would do that, these babies and children, they would actually have a whole series of drums that they would beat as loud as they possibly could so that other people couldn't hear the screams and the cries of the infants and children that were being burned to death. God had forbidden such behavior. That's never acceptable to him. He warned them over and over and over again, you cannot treat the weak, the powerless, the, 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 the poor, the, the, the young, you can't treat them like that, but they refused. And here's the dirty little secret why, because it's a power thing. When you can control somebody else and you can injure somebody else and they can't hurt you back, that feels like power. And we have seen some of these same kinds of things happening in our culture because in every realm, whether it's political, whether it's entertainment, whether it's companies and corporations, we have seen person after person after person coming forward and talking about the way that because they were weak or because they were young or because they were poor, they were being taken advantage of. Please understand, in most of these cases, it is not because some person has an oversized libido and just needs more sex in their their life. This is nothing more than a power trip. I will do what I want to someone, and it's not just that I can do it right now and get away with it, but every time they see me, their face will get red. They will walk out of the room. They will feel weaker because I am the one who is strong. I am the one who's invincible. And you would think to prove your power, you'd look for stronger people to dominate, but it's not how it works in this wicked and saturated dark culture in which we live. They keep looking looking for the younger and the weaker and the poorer and the powerless so that they can fracture their soul, not just for a moment, but for their entire lifetime. This is the world in which we live in, too. There's a power play that's going on, and it's against the powerless and the weak and the young and the poor. And God says it has to stop. Now, this is what's interesting to me is that some of the very same people who would condemn God for overthrowing such places like Jericho and the Bible will blame him for doing nothing when the same thing happens today. They think it was wrong when he did it in the Bible, and they think it's wrong that nothing is happening today. And they will say things like this. I'm sure you've heard it. It's the most favorite argument of all people who struggle with faith and spirituality. If there is a God, and if he is all good, and if he is all powerful, then how can these kinds of things happen in our world? And here's what I want you to know. God is all good, and God is all powerful, and God is patient, but there's coming a day that he will will bring justice to those who have been downtrodden. That day will come. That day will come. So he had to intervene. But it's not because he's fed up and he's run out of patience. The reason he's intervening is because the culture becomes so shot through with violence and death that there were no options. It had to be stopped or it would expand even far beyond the geographical boundaries it had held it in to this point. So Israel had actually been assigned by God to go in and end this violence and this death. But the nation of Israel had listened to the report of the 10 spies. They rejected the direction of God because, because they were afraid. Here's something you need to understand. Most people reject direction of God not because they're defiant, but because they're afraid. It still happens to people today. You cannot say yes to the great adventure if you constantly give place to your fears. We have to learn to face the things that we are afraid of. There are still people who refuse to follow the wisdom and the direction of God, not because they're rebellious. They're just afraid. They don't think it's going to work out the way they want. Fear will actually lead you to places that you thought only temptation could take you. You can wind up doing things out of fear that you thought you would only do because you were tempted. And here's the thing. It doesn't take an army to defeat the fearful. An internal, silent, stealthy, unchallenged thought launches a preemptive attack before any external 
enemy can. So Joshua is working his way through these kind of emotional challenges. And that's when he notices in front of him there's a man standing with a drawn sword in his hand. I had a person pull a knife on me one time. I didn't like it. And it was just a little knife. I didn't like it. I actually had a person pull a sword on me one time. It's a long story, and it's not worth your telling, and quite honestly, I prefer not to. But I can tell you a friend of mine with a pool cue saved my life that day. I'm grateful for him. A drawn sword indicates an intention to fight. You don't draw a sword when you're there in a posture of peace. And so this is what's interesting. We always think of Joshua as this kind of young, strapping, hero, Herculean kind of guy. Joshua is well over 80 years old at this point. He's the guy standing on his porch saying, get off my lawn. <laughs> and, and he goes right up to this guy. You got to love this. This 80-plus-year-old guy. Some of you just, it, Joshua just became your hero. He walks right up to this guy. He says, you get to decide today. Are you for us or are you for our enemies? Because this is not a spectator sport. We're not selling tickets to this thing. You get to choose right now to a guy. A young guy with a sword drawn already. This is Joshua. You got to love that about him. And he demands, choose. You're either for us or you're with our enemies. And the man surprises Joshua and us with his response. Because he says one word, neither. And that confuses us. Because we're almost certain that God will choose a side in this. And this is what he says, as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. This challenges our thinking. God does not choose sides. He isn't for one group of people over another group of people. He had come to end the brutal violence against the weak and the innocent. God doesn't choose sides. God asks us to choose sides. See, we think the great adventure of life happens when we can get God to back our adventure. And this is what I want you to know. That's not the great adventure of life. The great adventure of life is not when God chooses your side. It's when you choose God's side. If you want to say yes to the great adventure, stop asking God to take your side and choose to take God's side. When you choose God's side, you tend to make less demands and you tend to seek more direction. What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? The challenge is, of course, is that we're afraid that if God is in control, we won't get what we want. We're more afraid than that. We're afraid we'll get something we don't want. I used to teach teens, and I used to tell them, you can trust God with your future spouse. And that just absolutely terrified them. Because they were pretty sure that God had a closet full of people nobody else wanted. And he was just waiting for some poor, unsuspecting person that would say, whatever you want from me, God. And then God would just dump some hideous creature that no one would touch with a 10-foot pole on them. And that would be bound as their spouse for the rest of their unnatural, painful life. You know, it's just how people think about God. And it's not true. The problem is not that we want too much. The problem is that we settle for too little. When we pursue our own goals, they are always safer and they are always smaller. But when you pursue God's goals, he will lead you on a kind of adventure that is absolutely stunning. If you ever decide to pursue God's goals in your life, you're going to have to overcome bitter memories and you're going to have to face down your fears. God will not scale down his purpose and his promise for us. He comes to build us up so that we can live it out. That's God's purpose. So here's what I want you to know. It's never too late for you to become who you might have been. If this can be true for an over 80-year-old guy standing all by himself in front of a man with a drawn sword, it can be true of you too. This old man still has the memory of failure in his mind about a previous opportunity that was lost. But please hear this. Just because you failed in the past doesn't mean that God has changed his heart for you or his intention for you. You may choose to abandon him. He will never choose to abandon you. 
You don't have to give up on the hopes and dreams that God had for you. God is able to bring them to pass. In fact, maybe today is kind of an important moment in your life like it was for Joshua. Maybe fearful thoughts have been dominating your imagination and the decisions that you are making. And maybe you're actually beginning to surrender to the false assumption that the, the whole adventure of faith thing is for an elite class of spiritual people who are both younger and know more than you do. Please understand this. Becoming what God intends for you to be will not be determined by your ability, but it will be determined by your trust in his ability. That makes all the difference. So Joshua made his choice that day. Down on his knees he went. He surrendered freshly to the will of God for his life. And the rest, while well, it's kind of history, he led a group of people to the most formidable walls in the entire nations that surrounded that area in Jericho. And for six days, once a day, they would walk around these walls. This wasn't like a, a retirement gated community. This thing was huge. And the walls were formidable. And on the seventh day, they walked around those walls seven times. And after they walked around them seven times, they blew trumpets and they shouted and the walls completely collapsed before them and in that moment they were so glad that they said yes to the great adventure because their entire future changed there would be no more wilderness wandering and here's the thing is that wasn't the end of their grand adventure and it never is with God tomorrow is always better than today and the past if we actually dare to trust him you may feel like you've aged out of the adventures in the kingdom of God, but what I want you to know is as long as there's breath in your body, there's an adventure for you to live. That's what he's come to do for us. Let's bow our heads this morning. So here, here's... What I'd like you to kind of capture in your imagination today. The great adventure didn't begin when an entire nation, after a seventh trip around the city on the seventh day, shouted. It began when an 80 plus year old man surrendered to the will of God in a private moment, because that's how a great adventure always begins. If a shout would make whatever formidable situation you're facing collapse in front of you, then I'd lead you in the most raucous shout you've ever heard in your life. But it's not the breath in our lungs screaming into the night that changes our lives. It's the breath of his spirit coming into us and our willingness to say to God, whatever you want for my life, I think is better than what I want. And there has to be a decision. I'm not going to make all my decisions on the memories of how I failed in the past. And I'm not going to make all of my decisions based on what I'm fearful of or hiding from. And for some people in this room, that'll be the biggest thing you have done so far in your life. It's like there are reins that are trapped and tied to you and they pull you this way and that and you go down paths you would prefer not to go down and you stay still when you should be moving and it's just a bitter memory and a fearful thought that completely holds you captive. Wouldn't it be wonderful today? Wouldn't it be wonderful today if in kneeling to a heavenly father that he could give you a path forward so that your future can actually look different than your past instead of just a repetitive cycle of it. So Father, I ask, help us with this today. We are naturally fearful people. We remember with a kind of accuracy those things that cause great pain in our lives. And we will do a lot to avoid anything from happening like that again. Will you help us see that there's a path we've not yet trod and that you, the one who loves us more than we could possibly know, you will lead us unto your intended purpose for our lives. 
We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together this morning. Sing the God who was. The God who was and is to come. Oh. The power of the risen one. You're the God who brings the dead to life. You're the God of miracles. The God of miracles. Let's lift that up. The God who was and is to come. The power of the risen one. The God who brings the dead to life. You're the God of miracles. The God of miracles. Just your voice. Sing, I believe. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. So, Father, would you help us trust once again? that the stories of Scripture are not just accounts of something you've done once but will not do again. Would you help us trust that in every single one of our lives you desire to lead us into the good promises you have for us. Help us find the kind of faith that overcomes our fears today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated this morning. One of the areas that we are very fearful in our culture has to do when we're letting go of something. We don't do that easily and we don't do it well. Our culture keeps teaching and preaching to us that you're more significant if you just have more. And uh, I don't see a lot of commercials that suggest I should have less. I haven't seen a commercial that says you really don't need that new smartphone. Just go ahead back to a previous model. and. Uh, but here's what's true. God will challenge us. There comes a moment when we have to kneel before him and decide, is the significance of my life and the security of my life be going, going to be determined by what I can get? Or is the significance of my life going to be determined by what I release? And I will tell you what, you will have a lot of fear wrapped around that concept. But for those who are willing to bow and worship and understand that worship is not just something I say, it can also be something I release, those individuals discover that God has a vested interest in blessing those who will bless others because that way he gets to bless a lot of people all at once. So Father, we ask right now that you would help us in this moment. If, if there's someone who, maybe this is something they've never done, would you help them find the courage today to experience the change in their heart by the way they open their hand. In Jesus' name, amen.